in the physics department, we had some Commodore Pets and an Apple II, I think, and a few other things. And, and you could play some reasonably decent games on that. I remember Space Invaders on the Commodore Pet uh, that we actually managed to hack and uh, change around if we knew the right assembly. When you moved across to the sort of mini computer, which we had, the PDP-1170, people were always a little disappointed. You know, got my friends to come along and say, oh, yeah, look at this. We've got this big computer here. They say, well... First thing was, well, what games can you play on it? And uh, this was the version 7, which uh, I did find a, um, a virtual machine for somebody had made. You can actually all go and experience the virtual 7 environment if you really want to. But it had a very poor set of games, really. I guess that wasn't really their intention in making Unix. They were all very much sort of command line. So it would print something and you would type something in and it would print something else. Sometimes you might get a screen full. Um, I think there was a there was a chess, but we never really got going with that because that was uh, quite experimental at well. But there are other things. Uh, so if you're playing checkers or something, it, it would print a board and it would scroll up the screen. Um, and uh, obviously, this was at uh, early days of computing, and uh, the board rates were not very fast. So I think we we're mostly beyond 300 board, but we still use 300 board for some things, and that's painfully slow. Is this like networked gaming then? No, this this isn't. No, this is just just regular <laughs> connected to the computer. So, so despite talking about board rates, this is literally the terminal talking to the machine. That's right. It? Yeah, we're so used to I don't know Wi-Fi broadband, super fast broadband, fiber, mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. That to go back to these kind of BAUD, isn't it? Board measured in the hundreds. Yeah. Uh, it, it, what does it? What does it mean in terms of, say, an ASCII character? Uh, well, it's it's really, really slow. I mean, I've, I've written a uh, short um, emulator to show you what 300 board is. So if I look at uh, the manual page for one of the games, Arithmetic, and I print it or show it how it would appear on the screen at 300 board, uh, you can see it's a relatively painful experience because uh, you know, it, it's actually printing slower than I can read it. So you, you kind of get quickly frustrated. So that's 300 board. We didn't get very many things that ran at 300. A lot of the campus ran at 1200 board though. So if you wanted to connect to other machines or uh, just connect your terminal up to the computer center, that certainly ran at 1200 board. And that was a bit better. I mean, you can see here it's coming. It's, it's about the uh, same speed as you can read or at least scan. So, you know, Things coming out at that speed is, is um, a little painful. 9600, which we were running uh, all our terminals in the maths and physics building, that's much better. I mean, you, you can see that's coming out actually faster than you can read. So that comes out at a reasonable rate and you can actually do some things with that. That was kind of the, the backdrop to it, that uh, if you wanted to play any of these games, they because it all came out so slowly, there's very you, know, you, you didn't want to print out a lot of stuff on the screen because uh, it would take forever to display it. There was an adventure game that uh, people may well have come across. Um, that was all very text-based. You know, you're in a forest and you like, go left or go north or go south or into the building, and then it would chunk through and say, "Oh, this, describe the scene," and then it would abbreviate the scene because you didn't want to take all this time showing the scene again because. Uh, it would just take so much time. So that's kind of where we were at. And I uh, say there's various games you could play, tic-tac-toe and um, something called I Ching, which I never really understood, some mystical thing. And uh, there was a, a nice quiz game that um, you could actually load a database. So you could say uh, uh, they have one state capitals and uh, states. So you know, what's the capital of uh, New York and things like that. And you could play it in either direction. You could say... Okay, uh, given given the capital, what's the state or whatever. And you could write new games for that. So that was quite fun. And there was a Hangman game, I remember. But they're all rather poor and uh, uh, boring to some extent. And that's kind of the way it stayed until we upgraded to uh, the next computer, which was a VAX 750 running Berkeley 4.2, I think. We got in. We might have run one of the 4.1 versions. Berkeley 4.1. Is that a completely different kind of fork to version 7 unit? Yeah, it was taken from that. So we have version 7, which only really ran on a few things. So PDP 11s, and I think they put it to a couple of other things. 
and then they did get a vax at the at um, Bell Labs, and they did a quick port, which I think was called the 32V, 32-bit version or something. And it was really just a straight port of the PDP-1170, which had no virtual memory. So it was just ported straight over. And so just ran like a PDP-1170, but didn't use any of the extensions. So you were still limited to 64K programs. But uh, Ken Thompson went to Berkeley and took version of it, which is kind of why Berkeley got involved. He spent a year there as a professor, I think. And uh, they just sort of descended on it and said, well, we can do much better. We can actually start using the virtual memory so we can have programs as big as we like. We can mm. you know, don't need to be constrained. We can have paging and all this sort of stuff. So uh, I think they started with a version 2 on PDP-11s that didn't have virtual memory. And then they, they went to version 4.0, presumably, that uh, worked on the VAX with virtual memory. And, but crucially, it had a new game. Um, and this was uh, something called uh, Rogue, uh, which was uh, subtitled Exploring the Dungeons of Doom. And this was came about by two uh, uh, guys, Michael Toy and Glenn Witchman, who were working at uh, University of California, San Diego, I believe. But they eventually moved up to University of California, Berkeley, which uh, was the people who produced this um, 4.2. So this game was around in the atmosphere and... Uh, uh, it got included into these distributions. And it was based on uh, something written by Ken Arnold called the Curses Library. So you imagine the scene, we're all sitting at uh, these terminals, which are just like typewriters with screens attached, uh, but there are all sorts of different ones. So we used TDI 912s, there were things called VT100s, there was a Hazel Time. They're all much the same in if you just printed characters to the screen, you, you printed a line of characters and then a character return line feed would get you to the next thing. So scrolling up the screen was easy. But they also had mechanisms to position you at the screen. So you could say, go to the home position or you could go to a, an arbitrary position on the screen. Um, but they all used very different uh, sort of character sequences to do that. So what worked on the TBI 912 to put you to here would sort of turned into gobbledygook on something else. So we had a few programs that knew about this, but they were all sort of very hardwired. Sort of, oh, what terminal am I on? A, I'm on a TBI 912, right? I, I know how to get there. I'm on something else. I've no idea how to position myself to a place in the screen. But Ken Arnold came up with a library that uh, knew how to position itself on sort of pretty much any, any terminal there was and uh, had, a, had a database, so you could add new terminals to it, sort of mini programming language. Just by linking with this library, you could say, in a terminal independent way, go to this location and draw something. And it was very much optimized to work with 1200 and 300 board terminals so that uh, you, you got a good experience, whatever. So here is Rogue. So what's happening here is you're looking down on a dungeon. You're in a room here that's um, surrounded by these dashes. The doors are crosses. The monsters are capital letters, so we've got a snake there waiting to get to us. And uh, where are the at character highlighted? And there's a bit of gold over there that I can go and get. You can see the snake is after me, and I've got I'm on level one of the dungeon now with 44 gold pieces, 12 out of 12 hit points, 16 out of 16 strength, armor class four, and no experience. But I can get some experience by attacking the snake. Oh, this snake is attacking me there. Oh, I've got three points of experience. But I've lost a few so these two guys were using this library. They could actually now get to display on the screen anywhere. You could have this sort of adventure game and you could actually move around the screen and chase monsters and monsters could chase you and, and so on. So it was a fantastic thing. So there we are. I died. Never attack ice monsters. We spent many hours on it. It uh, was also procedurally generated. So each time you went into the dungeon, you got a new layout. So you couldn't learn it as such. You could learn what the monster did and you could learn what accessories were, and potions and scrolls and things like this and new weapons you could find. So you, you gradually built up your own database in your head of what was good and what was bad, but you didn't know what the dungeon was going to be like. Uh, it, it was new each time. Uh, you could save your progress, but uh, 
you couldn't copy the save file. They, they made sure of that, so you could restore it and carry on, but you couldn't cheat by saving yourself and then trying something out, and if that went wrong, go back to position. So they, they, they thought of that. So, uh, yes, uh, it, was, it was a fascinating thing and really changed things around a lot. And I think it's partly because of this Curses library, partly because uh, the, the board rates were getting faster and you could actually get somewhat interactive at this point. It's really interesting, the idea of procedurally generated maps. I believe that Elite on the BBC used procedurally generated maps. They did. How might that work? Yeah, you know, Elite is a really good example because they, they tried to cram as many star systems into a, a world as they could, uh, but found you could just hadn't got the, the uh, space to store all this. So instead, they, they worked off something procedurally generated. So you take a couple of numbers and you do some arithmetic on it or something and you, you get a sequence building up from initial seed. So you start with something and you know, multiply it by three, multiply it by three again or something, and, and you get a sequence of numbers and then you use those to map into sort of planets or something like that. So Rogue was very similar. I mean, it, it did have some rules behind it. It actually divided the screen into sort of nine, sequ nine squares, three by three. So you would probably have a room in each of those three squares and then they would be connected by corridors, but they would move around within those boundaries. And sometimes it would miss out a room. So there wasn't actually a room there. There was just a corridor that went through it and um, do that. So yeah, they played around with that and they played around with lots of these ideas. And um, eventually also Ken Arnold, who did the Curses Library, came on board and helped them uh, improve and uh, I think he also did quite a bit of extra work on the Curses library so that uh, it would be sort of optimal because there's, there's more than one way to get to a place on the screen. If you happen to be already almost there, you could sort of just move across a couple, which would only be two characters maybe, rather than maybe four characters to jump to a specific location. So you, you can sort of optimise things in that way. So yes, we, we played this rogue game for... Hour after hour, after after hours, in fact, because you weren't allowed to play games during the day. Um, so about 5.30, a script would run and games would be turned on and all descend on that. I don't know anybody who ever completed Rogue. Uh, I think you had to get down to level 24 in the dungeon where you pick up an amulet and come back and be the winner. I, don't, I think I got down to maybe level 20 once. That was as far as I ever got. I don't know anybody else in the department who got much further than that and certainly nobody completed it. There were stories on the internet of people who completed it, but uh, I've, I've never met anyone who have. So it was a particularly tough game. So, uh, you know, the first few levels were quite easy, but after that it got uh, progressively harder. So, Is it available as an emulator? Could people yeah, have it? Yeah, I just it? had a look. In fact, you can get it on Steam. There were versions that they ported after the Unix to uh, MS-DOS and Windows. They were always tinkering with the game and uh, there were a couple of reasons for this. One was just to make it a little bit more exciting and so on. Uh, but there was also uh, an, another branch to this, which I'll perhaps talk about in the uh, next video we make of this, where um, there were other ways of playing it. So uh, I'll just leave that there as a little taste of what's to come. But uh, yeah. Once, once I discovered this second level, I stopped playing the game and uh, uh, went, went to do something different instead, which uh, we'll talk about next time. If you do that, this Unix will get you started in the great world of multi-user on simple terminals. You can do your own thing. You'll run out of steam after about four or five years. So, it's all done, taken care of. And duly on the 1st of uh, uh, April, it came out as this uh, IP version 9.